Well, um, well, thank you very much to Alessandro for the kind invitation, and thank you for, for being here even without the appeal of a second, of a second talk. Um, so I, um, I thought a bit about what I wanted to speak about, and I decided that I think I'll talk about something which is a bit old, um, but it's something which I find that the, the standard lecture format doesn't, isn't very uh, conducive to giving a reasonable talk about. So I, and I think that this more, slightly more technical and a bit more casual format will work better. Um, but I hope that you interrupt me and ask questions, et cetera. Okay. Um, and so this is a couple years old. Um, everything I talk about will be with Mikael Eichmer. And maybe if I make it to the end, I'll talk about some things which are with, in, with some additional people as well. Okay, so um, I'll start with the following fact, which I think everyone knows. So in Euclidean space, the Euclidean round ball metric. Okay, so okay. So in other words, if you contain the same volume as a ball, the surface area is more. Okay. And so if you have equality, then morally you're, you're equal to the ball. Maybe there's some small set of measure zero. Okay. So that's clear. Okay, and so um, this, uh, I mean, this, this board could, cause has entertained mathematicians for millennia, right? Um, and so there's, there's a variety of different ways that I could go the things I could write next. So let me write something which is chosen based on my sort of talk, but not anything in particular. Okay, so you can prove maybe a stronger result than this, right? So under a weaker hypothesis, Okay, and so uh, if instead of looking at global minima, you look for stable critical points, well, the balls are still the unique stable critical points. Okay, so at this point, we could get into a long discussion about various similar results. So for example, if you just look at critical points, that's the Alexandrov theorem, okay? I'm not gonna talk about that direction. So this, I've chosen a very specific direction and I've ignored a huge amount of uh, alternative directions, okay? okay. So um, because it will be important for my talk, uh, I'll, I'll write this out a bit more precisely, but I'll take this moment to write it out a bit more precisely in a Riemannian manifold. Okay. So what does it mean to be a stable critical point for the isoparametric problem? Right? You should consider variations with fi which fix the volume and consider how the area changes. Okay. Okay. So we call the property of being a stable critical point for the isoparametric problem volume preserving stable. And so, okay, there's a bit of a disagreement in the literature. Some people would just call this stable, all right? I call it volume preserving stable. If right, if you have the usual stability and equality, right? This says area doesn't increase, doesn't uh, decrease the second order, but you restrict. to functions which have average zero on the boundary, and this is like requiring the volume is fixed, okay? So um, it's not too hard, it's not immediately obvious, but it's not too hard to show that this is the same as this, okay? Oh, sorry. And I should say volume preserving stable CMC, 
constant mean curvature. If this holds, I'm already messed up. And right, so what I really mean is you're, you're a critical point and you're a stable critical point, moreover. Right? All right. You can ask my calculus students about computing the Hessian at non critical points. They're quite good at that. Right. So, okay. So uh, I'd like to write up and actually prove maybe my, my, um, one of my favorite theorems. So. so this is the following theorem of Christodoulou and Yao, which I think um, was not, maybe it doesn't get the, uh, the attention it deserves. Um, so that's the following. So if you have a volume-preserving stable CMC sphere, then you get the following estimate for various quantities along the sphere. So the trace-free trace second fundamental form squared plus the scalar curvature of the ambient space restricted to sigma integrated gives you a lower bound from the, for this sort of Wilmore type quantity. Okay? Right, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in a minute, um, but okay. Any questions about that? And so, um, just as a as a warm up, I'll I'll prove this. Okay. So in modern language, it's it's not too hard. I think now if you know some tricks, but I think well, this is one of the earlier applications of this, this technique. So like, what do we do? We want to use a stability inequality, but we need to find functions which integrate to zero, right? So finding functions that integrate to zero is not always so easy. But what you do right so first of all uniformization provides us a conformal map to s2 right the round the model s2 but then um, by applying a further conformal diffeomorphism and like iterate like uh, composing with that we can arrange that the components of psi are all integrate to zero, right? They average out. So, so, so we can move the average of them around by applying a conformal diffeomorphism. So we can arrange that this holds. Is that okay? All right, okay. you look skeptical. All right, so because this holds, you get the stability inequality for each term. Right? And now you add from I1 to 3. So the, the sum of psi I squared is 1, right? because it's mapping into the unit sphere. Okay? So you get A squared plus Ricci nu nu less than or equal to the, I'll just be it like that. Right? But this is the energy of a conformal map, so it's twice the area of the image. Okay, so this is a pi. Okay, and at this point we're basically done. You just have to turn this into something that we want. All right. So uh, all right, I'll do it here. This is kind of poor board work, but okay. This thing. Let me get the Gauss. Uh, get the. So you use the Gauss equations, and you rewrite this in terms of the other things that you can you, you get from the Gauss equations. And you get all right. I promise, if you go to Wikipedia, you will look up Gauss equations. This is what you get. All right. I do that every time. Right. Then let's turn a into the trace-free part of a. Right. So we get an extra one half h squared. So we get three halves here. Okay. 
the integral of K Gaussian curvature over the sphere, because this is where we use your sphere. The integral of Gaussian curvature is, is 4 pi by gauss Poinet, right? So we get if I got that right. OK, so now everything is in place, but you have to do some multiplication, which I always seem to get confused about. But so we get 12 pi. Then we, we multiply by 4 thirds. That's 16 pi minus integral h squared. The 1 half becomes 2 thirds. And so that's let me know when I can pull, move it down. So, so that's the theorem. I'll move it down in a second. Okay. So that this this is the proof. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, okay. So, uh, using this. And I'd like to give the following silly proof of Barbosa de Carmo. It's not the whole, the whole statement, but it gives you a, a, a flavor of what actually we're going to do later. Right? So we're going to turn the silly proof into something kind of useful. Okay. So all right, I'm moving this down. Okay. So, um, So suppose that you have a volume-preserving stable sphere in R3. OK, this is silly for several reasons. First of all, we know that CMC spheres are round automatically. Um, you could try to use the Alexandrov theorem. There's many ways at this point to conclude. But let me give you a kind of a funny way of concluding. So, so Christy Du Liao right, tells you, well, the scalar curvature of flat space is 0. This thing is non-negative. So Christa de Yao tells you that 16 pi minus the integral of h squared is non-negative. Okay. But now, if, you've, if you uh, are paying attention, this is the opposite of the Wilmore inequality, right? the classical Wilmore inequality. Okay, so everything has equalities, and now we're we're very happy because, for example, the trace free second bundle form is zero, right? So it's umbilic. You're done. All right. So okay, that and th that's kind of uh, the, the 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 general flavor of something which I'm I'm going to do actually for real later. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. So um, I um. I'm, I'm not going to try to talk about all the situations where you can understand what are the volume-preserving stable CMC surfaces in a, in a manifold. Um, there's many different directions, again, that you could try to take this. So in, in homogeneous manifolds, there's been a lot of, a lot of homogeneous three manifolds been a lot of progress. Um, also, Celso, sitting in the back, has made some interesting progress about the isoparametric problem in, le in lens spaces. Um, so there's several people in this room who've contributed to this problem. Um, I'm not going to try to survey that, but instead let me change the game slightly. And so what I'm going to talk about today are situations where you can understand stable critical, or uh, like, like uh, volume preserving stable CMC surfaces in manifolds without like uh, exact symmetries, okay? only asymptotic symmetries. So that's, that's kind of the, the topic I want to talk about today. Okay. So. Um,
So um, I would like to introduce a class of manifolds where you can find some stable CMC surfaces. And then I want to talk about their uniqueness properties. Okay. Um, and uh, I've chosen not to talk about this from the GR perspective. So there is some relationship with what I'm going to talk about um, as relating to general relativity. But let me kind of ignore that aspect of the problem. And for me, just my motivation will be we're looking for situations where we can understand stable CMC spheres in, in manifolds which don't have symmetries, exact symmetries. Okay. Okay, so um, it's already a disaster. So um, I'll give a particular definition of asymptotic flatness that is convenient for me not to have to write things a bunch of times. Okay, so first of all, it should be a complete Riemannian manifold, maybe with boundary. Okay. So um, outside of a compact set, it's diffeomorphic to the Euclidean space minus a ball compact set. Okay, And so you have a chart right at infinity. You have some identification with a piece of R3. In these coordinates, OK? you asymptote to the Euclidean metric at a certain rate. Okay. So this is Euclidean. So um, this is, I've already started using notation, which um, I'm going to use heavily in the, in the future. So bars always mean Euclidean, right? Not bars always mean not Euclidean, right? So you're going to fall off at some rate, r to the minus tau. Tau should be between a half and one. OK, I don't want to talk about that too much. There should be some, some number of derivatives. When I state my actual theorem, I'll, I'll say how many derivatives I really mean. OK. Um, you always want the scalar curvature to be in L1. And finally, so this is usually, this is not always included in the definition of asymptotic flatness, but I would like. If there's non-zero boundary, it should be minimal, and there's no other closed minimal surfaces. OK, so um, in it. OK, so um, all right, so if you've never seen these before, you can ignore most of the technical conditions. If you have, then those are my technical conditions. Okay. So. Um, I will give some examples in a minute. But let me just tell you that in such a manifold, actually, several of these things are not needed for, my, for what I'm about to say. In such a manifold, there are many volume preserving stable surfaces. All right, so um, originally this was considered by Huskin and Yao, um, and then Lon did some very nice work uh, related to this, this problem, what I'm about to say, and then Christopher Nurse has also some recent, recent work related here. Okay. And so I guess the, the theorem I'll state is, is coming out of the work of Nurse. So consider an asymptotically flat three-manifold 
Um, I'm going to describe a condition, which looks very strange if you've never seen it. But there's a condition, which I, if you have seen it, it doesn't seem strange, um, under which you can find many stable CMC surfaces. Okay, so. So um, you can form the following sort of asymptotic quantity, which you call the ADM mass. And I'll assume the ADM mass is positive. Right? At this point, if you don't know what this is, just forget about what I just said. There's some condition on the metric at infinity under which you have the following result. Right? Then So M3, because it's asymptotically flat, looks like Euclidean space at infinity. And so we're going to describe a foliation of part of that infinity. Right? It goes all the way out, but it doesn't necessarily come all the way back in. Right? Uh, bye. All right, so you can foliate the infinity by volume preserving stable CMC spheres. Okay. And of course, um, well, in Euclidean space, you also can foliate the infinity of vo volume by volume preserving. Just take round spheres that move out. Um, but I'll, I'll say in some, see, I'll say it now. So yeah. Um, the, the scalar curvature in L1 or non-negative? Non no, that, that's not relevant. So only the, only the mass being positive is what you need here. Um, so you can imagine, right, how do you prove this? You try to, you, like, uh, you look at the Euclidean sphere, you try to invert the mean curvature operator to make the, the G mean curvature constant, right? So, well, the problem is that there's, in Euclidean space, there's translations in the kernel. So those translations are precisely killed by positive, positivity of the mass. Can you still say something about Under uh, this assumption. No. So, R, I mean, R falls. So, R decays like yeah. R to the minus 2 minus tau, because it's two derivatives of the metric. Um, and it's in L1, assumed. But um, it. it, it can be yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, because I've assumed the mass is positive, actually, I think you just assume the mass is non zero for this result. So, if you try to change one of these spheres by a small C2 alpha graph, normal graph, it's not going to stay CMC with the same mean curvature. Okay. Right? So in Euclidean space, there's no such uniqueness. I, have my, I, I, I say, oh, I have this great foliation that I'd like to sell you right, by balls just at the same center. But I've kind of made a foliation in a weird way because I, I could easily well consider this ball. So th that's what I'm trying to say is this doesn't happen here, at least locally in C2 alpha in some sense. So like if I take one of these guys and I perturb it just a tiny bit in C2 alpha, it's not going to stay CMC with the same mean curvature. Sure, the translation though, right? That's a C2 alpha graph. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. And so, okay, here's my like crummy picture. All right, so somehow they look sort of like this. They look roughly like round spheres in our coordinates, okay? All right, and we call this the canonical foliation. Okay. Okay, and so, um, I, I don't want to get into it, but there, there's some relation between these spheres and the fact that these sorts of things have some notion called center of mass coming from relativity. Um, the relation is not quite as straightforward as one might be led to believe. Um, there's been some recent work by Sederbaum and, and Nertz that shows that maybe uh, you have to be careful here. So I, I don't want to get into that exactly. Yes? Can you, 
Okay, so take, the, okay, the give, give, given a sphere, so okay, the following statement is definitely true. Maybe you could prove something slightly stronger at this level. So given a sphere, there exists epsilon, so that any function with C2 alpha norm less than epsilon, look at the normal graph of that function over this sphere. Mm -hmm. Then the normal graph, which is some other surface, does not have the same constant mean curvature. And so obviously in, in R3, this is false, because take one, move it a little bit, it's going to be a tiny normal graph. And then so that's, so they're, they're sort of rigid in some small, some small sense. And so why do you know they're rigid? Well, you've sort of, you've, you've uh, solved like a fixed point type problem to invert the Laplace, or the, the, the second variation. There any other questions? This is great. Keep them coming. OK. So. Um, I think I already got some questions about this because I think that there's the obvious question to be asked here. And um, the obvious question is like, like what, I mean, I wasn't very precise here because like we'd, we'd like to know how far you could really push this result, right? So what, what sort of uniqueness do you really get, right? So could there exist one here, right, if that's my picture, right? Um, could there exist one like here? Or maybe there's one that doesn't look at all like this. In the link. Right. Okay. All right. I could keep going. So OK. So um, uh, under this assumption, I don't think so. I don't know. Uh, I'll say that. I'll say that in a second. OK. So let, let me first ask stable CMC, and then I'll, I'll, I'll mention isoparametric. Okay. So are these the unique stable CMC in the, under this setting? Okay. And maybe you should be willing to impose some scalar curvature condition on Maybe scalar curvature non-negative, for example. That would be natural in the context of GR. Okay. Well, in general, the answer is no. Okay. So um, there's a very nice result of Alessandro and Rick. Which, OK, I won't state the result in its full generality, and I'll just draw a picture. But I think this should give you the idea. So there exists an asymptotically flat metric, which does the following thing, which is, is quite uh, you know, remarkable when you first see it. And this asymptotically flat metric, OK, I've drawn it as a plane, but it's really 3D. It's flat over here, and it's not flat. over here, and the scalar curvature vanishes. Okay. Obviously, you could do this without prescribing the scalar curvature to, to have a sign, say, not, not to mention b0. But, so, but even under the assumption of vanishing scalar curvature, you can really find a flat half space. Okay. So um, at this point, the, 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 the question, are sta large stable CMC surfaces unique, is obviously no. Right? It's a disaster. because in the flat half space, right, here's my flat half space, well, there's a stable CMC sphere, right? So any sphere, which, any sphere in the Euclidean part, I can make it as big as I want. OK, I can make it as big as I want, doesn't matter. I can find infinitely many of them, OK? So uniqueness fails, like, dramatically for this, for this question. So um, if, for those of you who are there, I gave a talk about this uh, in the scalar curvature workshop. Um, so if you want to salvage this result somehow, you, you, you'd like to still prove something, right? Your, your original dream is just false. So you say, OK, fine, I'll prove something else. So you can, you can go in two directions. And the direction that I talked about before, but I won't talk about uh, today, is that if you, instead of, uh, instead of looking at stable CMC spheres, if you look at isoparametric, and OK, I'll assume the scalar curvature is non-negative, such as this case, right? Then the canonical foliation. All right. 
So, so if you, OK, under the assumption of non-negative scalar curvature, OK, and obviously not flat, because in Euclidean space, there's many, many minimizers. But if you assume non-negative scalar curvature and you're not flat, then these guys are critical points, but they're not minimizers. I feel like I'm teaching calculus. Right? They have a, a, higher, a higher area for the volume enclosed. Okay? So it's better to be in the canonical foliation. OK. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today, instead of this result, so I want to talk about the other direction you can go in trying to salvage this story. And so instead of assuming you're a minimizer, I want to still study critical points, stable critical points, but I want to impose a stronger decay condition on the metric. Okay? There's kind of you have to do you have to go somewhere, so that's where we're gonna go. Okay, so so fix the volume. Yeah. Find a volume enclosing find a region a, a, a set enclosing that volume with a minimal surface with minimal perimeter. Does that already exist? Uh, so in a in a compact manifold, yes. Yeah, yeah. In an open manifold, no. So part of the theorem is that the minimizer exists, and it's, and it's this. So like uh, the existence is not is not clear from the get from the start. Like there exists open manifolds, so that there's no solution to the isoparametric problem for any but volume. But is that true for this type of manifold? Um, well, I think so. For large volumes, yeah. it's not too hard to prove that minimizers exist. For small volumes. Um, it's actually quite a, a non-trivial thing. So that's only known in dimension three. Um, it was pr proven by Yu Gang Shi. Right? So, so they, and he uses a kind of a clever, uh, you need to do something somehow clever. It's not, it's not obvious. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. So okay, everything I say will be for, for, for large. So, if you have non-negative scalar curvature, exactly, yeah. Um, and so that problem. A solution for every yeah, yeah, yeah. But it might only be unique for large volumes. Precisely, it's it's also unique very close to the horizon. But yeah, so um, there's not many results about the the medium volume isoparametric regions. Um, there's been some investigation into if you have an isoparametric region which has equality here. Um, it's actually uh, like if you know the sort of results about rigidity results for scalar curvature comparison, you say, oh, that's going to go the standard way. But actually, I don't think that if you have equality here, it's not known that the, the, intrinsic, the manifold is intrinsically round. So that's still an open problem. So if you work out what the PD is here, it, it's more complicated than usual. So um, there's still some sort of nice open. There's recently some interesting work, but still there's some open problems, I believe. Uh, relating to this equality. So, okay. Th that's the only thing that I know that has anything to do with medium regions. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, that would be a very interesting direction to, to go. But I don't, know, I don't know how to do anything. Are there any other questions? Okay. So, and yeah. Is it known that you have to be so no, no. I mean, um, like, part of the proof, you, you end up proving that they're spherical. Um, in, yeah, it, 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 it's not totally clear. So like, um, by, by a blowdown argument, you can see that most of them are spherical. Like most of, the, most of the region is spherical. But the particularly difficult case is where you blow down to a, a, a sphere which cuts through the origin. right? And then you, you could have genus sucking into the sphere. Okay. So in the end, you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think an even bigger question would be connectedness in medium regions. Because. Would that contradict me there? No, it'll be not with scalar curvature. No, uh, wait. With, 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 um. It cannot be, oh, okay, that's going to Yeah, could they, like, there could be stable CMC in these manifolds. Like, I think that, um. Doesn't Hubray have an argument for. No, Hubray. Specifically, doesn't know how to to, uh, to prove connectedness. Like uh, in his thesis, he proved the Penrose inequality under the assumption that they are connected. Um, so, like uh, proving connectedness would be a big a big result, I think. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, if I remember correctly, yes, some result 
but it's from quantity breach here, right? So, so it doesn't really, oh, sure. it Under doesn't really mean anything, but I think it, this is what Andre mm. was referring to. So yeah. yeah. At the end of his thesis, he has this very nice volume comparison for scalar and Ricci at the same time. And there, because Ricci is positive, you know connectedness exactly like Alessandra said. But in the scalar, in the non-negative scalar curvature case, you, I think you don't, you don't know. Um, apparently, there's so apparently you can construct an example where they're disconnected. Like, I mean, or even just take a manifold with two horizons, the very small volumes will be disconnected. So somehow, okay, there's a that's a, that's a proof. Right, any other questions? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. No, no. Uh, oh, this result, yes. So I don't quite know. I don't quite know what happens without that outermost. There's something is something could get confusing without outermost. I think the next thing I'm going to talk about, I would guess that it would be false for sure without outermost. This one, I I don't know exactly. So. Um, in the result I'm about to, to state, we definitely use, although I don't know that it's necessary, but we definitely use no outermost. Or no, uh, no outer, like we use outermost, sorry, not just outer minimizing. Um, I haven't put that much thought into the weakening that hypothesis. So there could be something, something. All right, so let's put the theorem here. OK, so um, unless there's other questions. OK, so um, we, uh, we'd like to somehow avoid this situation if we're looking, we're trying to study the critical points. So somehow we'd like to, to avoid this situation, right? So I'd like to tell you about a theorem that involves uniqueness among critical points, stable critical points, not just minimizers, OK? So somehow we have to exclude this set of metrics. And the way that we'll do this is assuming some asymptotic rotational symmetry, right? So asymptotically flat manifolds are asymptotic in some sense to flat space. And then we're going to assume that the next order term is rotationally symmetric, OK? So there's, OK. OK, so um, I'll say you're asymptotic to Schwarzschild. If, in addition to be asymptotically flat, so all the things I said before, plus you have the following stronger fall off, OK, so. Um, So I'll assume that the, the metric has some asymptotic symmetry at order r to the minus 1. And then, OK, I don't care past r to the minus 2. Probably, OK, if you really wanted, you probably could change r to the minus 2 to something weaker. But all right, that's, that's neither here nor there. Okay. So OK. And so if you don't know, this metric is the Schwarzschild metric. And in this sort of business, it's one of the first things you might learn about because it's a unique, rotationally symmetric metric of vanishing scalar curvature. Okay, So that's kind of this context. OK, and so the theorem that I'd like to tell you today is the following. OK, so we'll consider a manifold, which is C6, C6 asymptotic to Schwarzschild. OK, I'll mention where 6 comes in, but you'll never really see it. And it has vanishing scalar curvature. OK, so again, I'll mention where vanishing scalar curvature comes in. But um, if you're used to results in this sort of direction, usually non-negative scalar curvature is the correct assumption. So here, um, 
actually, this, this theorem is going to be false without non with, with non-negative scalar curvature. So there's something a bit funny going on at infinity. OK. So if you have an embedded surface, that's volume preserving stable CMC, right? Then, and I keep forgetting this, it has large area, right? Large, depending on the metric. Right. Then it's in the canonical foliation. Oh, sorry, so the yeah. Oh yeah. So so it's, so well, it's unique locally. So so okay. So I, this this is not just what we like. Several people have proven various uniqueness statements. I'll tell you about that in a sec. But I mean, I think this justifies the name. No, I don't think so. I mean, he proves uniqueness in a, cl in a certain class, but there's some geometric assumption based on, like, you, you assume yeah, that right. there, is some class in which there is some class in which it's unique, more, certainly more than, more than this. Yeah, I, I, I'll get to that in just a second. But certainly, this is not the only thing that was known before our work. I don't want to make that, make that claim. Okay. But there, there is some sort of uniqueness. No, no, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, otherwise the, the, the name would be, you know, the name would be bad. I mean, maybe it's a proof by name, right? It's, it's, it's unique because it, otherwise it wouldn't be canonical. Right. Okay. Okay. So, all right, okay. So, is that theorem true or uh, clear? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. Okay. So, okay. Um, okay, so, uh, all right. so certainly after writing this, I should tell you that indicate the things that have come before. Okay, and um, I'll start. Okay. So, okay, so, um, uh, my first remark should be that uh, Brendel has proven that in the exact Schwarzschild metric, right? So where you do have the exact rotational symmetry, then um, this theorem is true, but also much, much more is true. So you can cross off large and cross off stable just being embedded CMC. So like the Alexandrov theorem implies that you're not just a leaf in the foliation, but you're a round centered sphere. Okay. So that, that works for all volumes, right? But the, uh, the flavor is going to be quite different because we're only able to prove things asymptotically. And pro presumably, things are only true asymptotically because it doesn't make sense to foliate this manifold all the way down. He states it for embedded. I imagine his proof should work for immersed, but let me. It, it's. There. It, if I had to bet, I would say it works for Alexander Vermeers, but let me not make any claims. Yeah, so it probably is, is OK. Um, and in our theorem, I don't, like, I bet you that you could weaken embedded. You could probably even remove the embedded. We don't really, we're not really, no, sorry, I take that back. So you probably could look into removing the embedded situation, but I don't think it's so clear exactly. OK, so the thing I'll tell you about today doesn't rely on embeddedness so much, but other results do. OK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the only the half. And it's also false outside of the half short shield. So for me, that's the, I guess, the full, full short shield based on my definition, because there's no, you want to cut at all, you cut at the horizon. For me, that's asymptotically flat. But of course, your definition is much more correct in some ways. Yeah, exactly what yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK, and so. Um, So 
So uh, this sort of is the culmination of several results. Um, and let me try to list it this way. So over here, I'll, like, I'll list the results that literally go into this, like that are input to this theorem. Um, and then there's been quite a few works which don't exactly go into this theorem itself, but they're very related. So I'd like to also list them. Okay. So the, 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 th the results that go as input first Okay, so Huskin Yao and Ching Tian, Brendel Eichmer in some settings could go use, be used as input, um, although we slightly strengthened that result in a, a companion paper. Um, and then there's work of uh, Mikhail and I with Alessandro um, that also goes into this. But also, I should mention Lon, uh, Ma. Um, several other works which are very closely related, although don't exactly fit into this. This the, like they're not they they're, they're not used as as exact inputs, but they're they're quite close. Okay. So um, what I'll tell you um, maybe now is that um, uh, let me see where I wanted to stop. Okay, cool. So what I'll tell you now is a bit about what you know before starting to try to prove this, and I'll try to explain what these results prove, and then the issue that's remaining. And I'll, then I'll, after the break, I'll try to tell you how we resolve that. OK. And so um, I should say that what I'm about to tell you is out of historical order. OK, so don't, don't sue me. So uh, but maybe, maybe in terms of re revisionist history, it makes the most sense geometric. Are there any questions? OK, so okay, again, this is out of historical order. But if, if you start thinking about this problem, um, maybe the, the first thing you might imagine, so OK, how do you try? Well, I should show you the theorem. So we want to understand large volumes preserving stable CMC surfaces. We want to show they're in the canonical foliation. OK, so Right, I, I'm not going to label anything as subsequences, but you can imagine this is like a long subsequence. So consider a volume-preserving stable CMC surface with big area. Okay, so essentially the, the the game is going to be to pin down the behavior of these surfaces enough to then put them in the canonical foliation. Right. So a priori, this is not um, very much information. Right. So the surface could be quite wild. All right. So the first thing you might ask, although this was maybe the last thing proven, is does the surface go into the asymptotic region, right? So, um, okay, I've like in here in the asymptotic flat definition, we have slightly strong, stronger asymptotics. We allow the metric to do whatever in a compact set, right? It should have non-negative scalar curvature or zero scalar curvature. That doesn't matter in this setting. But maybe you have some scalar curvature control. Maybe you don't have closed minimal surfaces in the interior. But that's still like a very flexible class of metrics. right? So on, in the compact set, you shouldn't expect much control over the metric. So somehow, you'd be quite afraid about this situation. Okay? So that's the first problem. All right. Yeah, OK, exactly. Yeah. No, no, this is great. Okay. So, um, but I guess it is defining R norms, right? Oh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I can imagine, but. Okay, so um, let's, let's choose just a random point in the manifold. Right? So we'll consider pointed asymptotically flat manifolds, if you want to be fancy. Um, and so 
what I'd like to say is that the inner radius is, say, the distance to that point. Okay? And so everything I'm going to talk about is always going to be some asymptotic sense, so I don't care what the point is. All that I'm trying to do is you say that you go infinitely far away from every fixed point in the manifold. Okay? And so um, this situation, so okay, let me say, so suppose the inner radius is not going to infinity. Okay? So let me draw you a picture of such a thing happening. So consider a sphere in Euclidean space, like uh, the sphere of radius r centered at r e3. Right? So this sphere always goes through the origin. Okay? So then I can then when I make it bigger, like this, right? And these are all volume preserving stable seams, see? And in the limit, whatever I mean, I get a plane, R2. Okay? And so the plane is not CMC, it's minimal, right? And it's not just volume preserving stable, but it's stable. Okay? Um, and so, uh, this, this sort of like little model problem turns out to represent really the situation I'm worried about. And so this, I think, goes back, in this context, goes back to uh, Eichmann and Metzger that says, So Eichmann and Metzger point out that you can rule out the following sort of process by ruling out stable minimal surfaces. Okay, I haven't been very precise here, right? Because if things stay a bounded distance, we can try to take the limit and get a stable minimal surface. Okay, I haven't proven that you get a stable minimal surface in the limit, but just, just by that, okay? Um, and then, so, well, why, are, why is this something you might hope to have a chance of? And, Somehow, the original result, for, in terms of geometers looking at these sorts of spaces, is the positive mass theorem proven by Shane and Yao, and they develop a mechanism for doing this. Okay? So their mechanism doesn't exactly work here. What Eicher and Metzger do doesn't exactly work in this setting, but let me tell you the... the, the story. Okay, so Eichmann and Metzger did work under positive scalar curvature, okay, um, and sort of weaker asymptotics, and then um, Alessandro sort of sh showed that instead of positive scalar curvature, the Schwarzschild asymptotics would, were enough to rule such a thing out. And he did some work uh, proving sort of weaker assumptions on the volume growth. Um, <coughs> oh, I lost a great chalk. That was a big mistake. Um, and so uh, this result doesn't quite apply in this setting because of some technical issues with properness. Okay? Um, and so you, this picture looks quite nice. But actually, if you start thinking about it, this limit might be non-proper. Because um, you don't have any a priori area bounds. And so that's what we. Right. We, we, we showed how to handle the non properness of the situation. Okay. Um, okay. So, cool. So, this like pseudo sketch. Proves that as the, the stable CMC get bigger and bigger, the inner radius gets bigger and bigger. Because otherwise, you could take the limit and find a stable minimal surface and rule that out using some souped up PMT mechanism. Okay. Yeah? So, in that uh, process, do you change the 
No, no. So here you're, you're just, because you stay a bounded distance from the center, so you can just sit at star and watch the, the process unfold in front of you, and you get then a stable minimal surface in the limit. So yeah, so what's coming, we're going to then change the metric. But at this point, we don't need to do anything. We can, because we stay a bounded distance, it's, it's going to happen to us just as we, we stand still. So is star allowed to do No, no, no. Yeah. Because otherwise, you get a stable minimal surface in R3. And that's, of course, not a contradiction. So you can use that sort of idea to get some information about the surfaces. But uh, yeah, that doesn't, that's not going to let you get a direct contradiction. <coughs> Any other question? So in, um, if to rule out, so to rule out this stable minimal surface, you need a synthetic structure. Yeah, so. Um, Do you also need scalar type? Uh, scalar not negative. So um, if you lose the asymptotics, then there's the Carl Otter Shane examples otherwise. So scalar positive, you don't need the asymptotics. That was Eichmann Metzger. Right. OK, so. Um, Maybe I'll stop here, we'll take our break, um, and then I'll pick it up when we get Thank you very much, and thanks you, thank you for uh, coming back. Um, so, okay, so let's just rewind for a second. So where are we? So we have volume-preserving stable CMC with area going to infinity, right? You should imagine this is a sequence, but I'm too lazy to write the, the subscripts, right? And so, I kind of argued for you that the inner radius, the distance from the, con the center, is going to infinity. Okay? So in particular, now there's maybe some more hope that this problem can be solved. Because this, the surface lies eventually in the region where you have asymptotics. Okay? So that suggests that maybe you can analyze what's the difference between the metric along the surface and the Euclidean metric, and how does that affect being stable CMC. Okay. Okay. And I'll remark um, already that this fact implies you're a sphere. Already, um, it's not totally obvious. You can prove it. Uh, I won't prove it for you. But from now on, I'm going to assume everything is a sphere. Okay. So if you don't like this implication, you can either try to prove it, or you could just believe me and restrict the theorem to only spheres. But it, it really does. Now that you know this, you know that then sigma is a sphere. Okay. okay. Um. OK, so I have my, my volume-preserving stable CMC sigma, right? And the area is going to infinity, OK? And my metric is fixed, right? So then I'd like to get some information about these surfaces. So let me rescale everything, the metric and the surface, so that the new, the new surface has area 4 pi, OK? And so, of course, the, the surface lives entirely in the Euclidean region. So we can just imagine the Euclidean metric and the, the, the G metric are lo lo living on the same place for where this is, this is uh, relevant. So just like literally do a homothety in the Euclidean coordinates until this is true. Okay? And carry the G metric along for the right. Okay. And so, okay. OK, so first of all, the rescaled metric, as you're sucking everything in, converges to the flat metric, right? because the, the metric decays towards flat. So when you rescale, you're, it's becoming flatter and flatter. 
in, okay, C6, at this, we'll, you'll never see why the 6 matters during this talk, so you could put C2 or something. It just doesn't matter. But in some holder space, locally away from the origin, okay? Right, so that's, that's what you get when you sort of homothety in so this, this sort of metric. That's from the asymptotic flatness. Um, okay, and then, so now you have a sequence of volume-preserving stable CMC spheres in this converging metric. There's some singular point of the convergence. Well, you can take the limit, then you argue that the singular point is removable in the limit. So this step is not trivial, but you can, you can show that this is true. And so these surfaces converge in C2 alpha away from the origin, right? So they might be passing through the origin, and there the metrics, like the metric is, is quite bad. We don't have any control on the metric near the origin. So we don't make any claims near the origin. But OK, there's some singular point for the convergence. It's removable for the problem. And then you get a volume-preserving stable CMC surface of area 4 pi in Euclidean space by, Bar Bar by, Bar by, uh, by Barbosa do Carmo. It's a round sphere radius 1. OK? All right. So there's something to be said here, but not by me. Okay. Okay, so the picture might be this, right? So sigma is a small graph over this, this sphere, right? Or S1 of C might pass through the origin. No reason that doesn't happen. And then we're not making any real claims near the origin. You could prove that it converges in some Hausdorff sense. Like very, in any weak sense, it's going to converge. But in the, the holder sense, it's definitely not going to be clear that it converges. OK. Yeah? No, so um, I haven't assumed anything about the mean curvature. You can prove, although um, I, last night I was preparing this talk, and I got really confused about this fact. It's not too hard to prove if you do it correctly. You can prove that the area going to infinity means like the, the mean curvature is going to, to zero. And even the area and the mean curvature are related in the way that you would expect the, the Euclidean ball. So like if the mean curvature is like 2 over r, the area is approximately 4 pi r squared. OK, so. so. The, the mean curvature is approximately going to be 2, 1, 2, depending on your, who you are. But yeah, so the mean curvature of this rescaled surface away from the origin. So sorry, the, like the G mean curvature is going to be approximately 2. Sorry, it's a constant. But the Euclidean mean curvature here is going to be approximately 2. But I have no idea what it is here. That's an important point. Because that's like a change of metrics, like how does the mean curvature change. So no, no information here. Away from here, it's approximately 2, the Euclidean mean curvature. The G mean curvature is a constant, which is about 2. Does that, does that answer your question? You can ask it again. It's okay. I have to no. it OK. OK. So um, so I'm, you kind of have to split things up into two cases. So one case is that 0 is in the sphere. In the other case, zero is not in the sphere. Okay. Um, and so, okay, if you're really paying attention, there's one case that I've ignored. And so, after you've rescaled to size four pi, you might be like this sphere, and then as you go in the limit, maybe you're leaving the picture. Right? So it's possible that you, you don't get anything in the limit. And that's something you have to analyze. But let me ignore that for now. OK? OK. So case two is the good case. Oh, and I guess case two also can, can, like, allows for services which don't enclose the origin but don't <coughs> hit the origin. Right? So I'm making a distinction based on whether or not the surface is passing through the origin. Right. And analy analytically, this means in case two, you converge in C2 alpha everywhere. In case one, there's this singular point for the convergence. Okay.
Okay, so in case two, you get nice C2 alpha convergence everywhere. Okay, and so it's a C2 alpha graph over the limiting sphere. Okay, and so this means that you can apply analysis, right? So you can fit. So you can fit this, this surface into Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction and show that the existence or non-existence becomes entirely prescribed by a finite dimensional problem, which you can compute. Okay? So what's the point? Right? Let's just look at this one. So before passing to the limit, you have like a CMC sphere, which is a small graph over this guy. And the metric is very close to Euclidean along this sphere. Right? So you can ask, how do I invert the CMC problem for the metrics nearby and look at surfaces nearby? OK? Right. And all right, so uh, what, what it turns out, as usual in these sorts of, this sorts of problem, right, the, the issue is that in Euclidean space, round spheres, the CMC problem has a kernel for the linearized problem because there's translation. Right? So, all right, so you invert perpendicular to the kernel. And then you say, well, the, the part in the direction of the kernel is fine as long as we have, it's a critical point of an auxiliary function. Okay, so natural constraint. Oh, and I should say, oh yeah, okay. Um, so I, I'll give, I'll say who did what in, this, in a minute here. Okay, so. So if we, if we go back to the original sigma and write its area as 4 pi lambda squared, that's our parameter, then the question of whether or not sigma tilde or sigma was CMC is, is equivalent to there being a critical point of the following functional. So this is what the analysis gives you. OK, so I'll just show you the graph. So, oh. so it's going to be a function on the set of centers of case two spheres. So when, when C has norm one, that's a bad case, right? So we want to ignore that, right? That's this case, right? C is up here, has norm one. Other than that, we can completely describe this problem by looking at critical points of a finite dimensional function whose graph, you know, here's R2. And the graph looks something like this. OK, and so let me describe to you what f lambda looks like. So for C with norm less than 1, it looks something like a paraboloid downwards, right? And you see that the mass is entering, and the mass is what makes this a non-trivial problem. Uh, in flat space, of course, this isn't, you can't do this, OK? So this analysis. Um, oh, I should also add, yeah, we're going, yeah, here, okay. So this analysis, in some sense, is due to Huskin Yao, okay. Um, I've taken a very revi revisionist point of view on this result, okay, but, okay. So if you know that critical points, so stable, like uh, critical points here are equivalent to critical points of this function, when, well, there's a unique one and it's close to the origin. Right, that's what this analysis tells you. Right, it's a proper laid down. There's basically a, a unique one here. Right? OK. Yeah. So this, like a, so there exists a, a stable CMC sigma tilde 
if and only if the gradient of f lambda at c vanishes. And it's, and it's a stable critical point. Okay. So okay, the, the center you might have to adjust slightly. But essentially, the gradient vanishing means that there's going to be a, a, a critical point. And if it's a stable critical point, which it definitely is, then you get this. Okay, Is that clear? So somehow this is something where if you've seen this sort of argument before, I think it should, is clear. And if not, it's almost impossible to do it justice. Okay. Um, OK, so out here, um, well, I've kind of drawn, like from the point, this point of view, I've really basically drawn the graph. It's very close to being flat. Okay. So then the issue of critical points is a bit subtle. So it's not, you don't have this strong mass effect playing, like forcing a unique critical point here. Outside, it's subtle. Um, and it turns out that the scalar curvature enters here. All right, and this was first analyzed by Brenda Eichmer. Right. And then um, we slightly strengthened their, their, their work in a follow-up paper. And this is where you need vanishing scalar curvature so, and C6. So the two mysteries in the theorem statement, um, I've just written as two letters. So I'm sorry, I won't talk about that. Okay. So there's something else I'd like to talk about. OK, is that OK? So somehow, these are the situations in which um, analysis takes over. Right? It's not, I'm not saying it's a trivial, like you can't just say, now we apply analysis. But these are the situa situations in which the analysis of this function um, tells you everything you want to know about the existence of stable CMC. Okay? So um, if you're good at describing all of R2 as the union of sets, you've known, you notice that I've missed some things. Which is, the, which is c equals 1, right? So that's case 1. OK? All right. So the remainder of what I want to talk about is case 1. OK. okay. So. OK, so if you, if, you're, if you look here, so OK, what I'm about to say is definitely not like a rigorous proof, but it gives you some flavor of the two different possibilities. So if you're inside of this, the unit sphere here, there's like a huge derivative, right? The derivative is like the, radi the gradient points radially, right? And so you could imagine that if you get very close to here, maybe there's some error that's really hurting you, but you're still going to hope to have a large derivative here. And so maybe you can prove that if c equals 1, but you're kind of like a point down here, you don't exist. Okay? That's what you kind of expect. And so what does it mean to be kind of like a point down here? Well, if the surface contains this fixed point star, so it's containing the center of the manifold. That's like case 1.1, one, one, right? right? So that should behave like this, and you expect that a radial deformation contradicts the CMC property, right? That's kind of what this predicts. And indeed, that's true. OK, I, cannot, I don't have enough time to, to explain to this, explain you how this works, but this So Huskin Yao and Ching and Tian showed that indeed under C equals 1, in the C equals 1 condition, if the, 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 the inside of the, the, the manifold is contained, like if, you, if sigma separates star from the, the end, then there's no such surface. OK? Is that all right? So finally, like, 
What you want to ask is what, what's the remaining case, right? So the remaining case is that the center is not inside of sigma. So what does that mean? That means, let's say this is the, the center of our manifold, that I am the sphere that looks like this. So I'm getting bigger and drifting away at the same time. OK? Uh, right? But I'm drifting away quite slowly compared to my size, so that when I rescale the unit size, I still pass through the center. OK? That's, kind of this, that's the last situation we're worried about. All right, and so that's, this is really what we've, we've proved in order to finish this, this story. And so consider a metric which now we only really need C2. We only need non-negative scalar curvature. So some of the mysteries from before have been cleverly deleted. Um, and we'll consider a stable CMC surface in the manifold, embedded. Okay. Right? So because it's a closed uh, surface, it has an inside and an outside. So we assume that this point is not in the inside. You can call this outlying. Right? That's like this picture. Okay. Then we have the following estimate which says that the inner radius times the mean curvature, right? This is the scale invariant quantity, distance, one over distance, OK? So inner radius times mean curvature is bounded from below by a fixed number, OK? So this is a scale invariant So like here, when we rescale, it doesn't change, OK? So in other words, in this picture, the inner radius times, so the mean curvature is approximately 2, right? So the inner radius times 2 is bounded from below. So this can't happen. I mean, that's, that's the theorem. OK? Any questions? Right. OK. All right. So um, in my uh, remaining time, I'd like to sort of try to show you how we prove this, because the proof um, is quite different from what's been done before in order to push I, either this to push things around or the Lyapunov-Schmidt style analysis. So, so it's, it's, I think it's kind of, yeah. Do you still, I mean, there are, of course, lots of technical points, sure. but are you still getting that positive eta by sort of a compactness? Yeah, sure, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so you take a sequence going through? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. There's no, I mean, I have no effective estimate on that. Well, actually, you might be able to effectivize. It's not quite as compactness-ish as you might imagine. Um, at the end of the day, we do prove an estimate that probably you could make reasonably effective. So the way it's written, it's definitely there's no notion of it being effective. But I think it could possibly, now that I think about it, it's, it could possibly be um, like proven a bit more in an effective manner. Like uh, we don't act, like let's put it this way: we never take a limit. We prove directly this inequality. But various steps that go into the proof of the inequality involve some complete some compactness argument. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you. Maybe that's a bit more clear. Okay. OK, so let me prove this. But I will assume, um, for the sake of everyone's sanity, that you're an exact short shield. Right? Of course, this, again, this situation is already covered by Zemon's theorem. But OK, you can, it, the, theorem, the proof that we give, the error terms aren't going to kill you. 
You have to trust me. And then I'll also assume that the surface is a sphere. Okay? And I, I asserted to you that that was true, but I didn't prove that. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay, so the, if you have followed the general reason for what, why I did things, of course, this theorem is going to enter, right? So in some sense, the, the idea of this proof is to use this trivial proof of, or not trivial, maybe silly proof of Barbosa do Carmo that I gave in the beginning, um, except there's kind of a, a big difference here. So here, this is the G mean curvature, right? And so now we have an estimate for this G quantity, which is not the Wilmore quantity anymore, right? So this has some relation to the Wilmore quantity, but not exactly. And so what you do is you, we're going to try to understand how this relates to the Euclidean Wilmore deficit. And then to squeeze out somehow, like there's tension between the two inequalities, and this inequality pops out out of that tension. OK, so that's the goal. And so I'm going to try to write everything in, in terms of Euclidean quantities, so like barred quantities. Okay. 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 So first of all, the uh, the volume form changes like this, right? So um, I'll let you. It's like distance squared, right? This, the metric and the volume form of the surface are the same, scale the same, right? So that's the right power. Okay, and then. The mean curvature okay so the mean curvature under conformal change um, if you uh, are bored with my talk, you should just figure out how to compute this, this fact, right? It's a nice exercise. Um, so the mean curvature with respect to the Schwarzschild metric satisfies the following slightly complicated expression with respect to the Euclidean mean curvature and the um, and the, basically the derivative of the conformal factor. Okay? Um, and so I'll just point out something which you might be confused about. So it's not clear how to control the Euclidean mean curvature of these surfaces, right? Because this is a number which is just like going to zero even. But this, ter this quantity, well, it's going to go to zero probably because this is one over the, the uh, like, well, there, this is like has size x. This is x cubed, so it's one over x squared. But you have no control over how quickly x goes to infinity, right? That's the whole issue of the, uh, of the, the, the inner radius. Right, so somehow this is what I mean in the in the title when I say sort of scale breaking issues. So like there's the scale of the mean curvature, and there's the scale of the inner radius, and if you're not careful, you have to you have to check how they interact. Right, so like if you try to ask, if you try to say h bar is bounded in some way, you can't bound it in terms of the mean curvature, which is a nice quantity, but you end up bounding it in terms of the inner radius, which is not a very nice quantity. Okay, all right, so that's the idea. Okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. So we'd like to compute this quantity, right? So I've written this in a suggestive way, because if we square this, we get the volume form times h squared, which is what we want. Right? right, so this is the volume form times the mean curvature squared, which is what we're, we're after. This is what Chris Dooley Yao controls. OK. Well, hopefully we all know how to do this. 
right? Minus one plus. Okay, so I put the two in a funny place that you might not be expecting. Okay. Okay, so, you know, you just square it, whatever happens. Okay, so now I'd like to, I'm trying to get at the Christodoulou-Yau estimate. So let me integrate both sides with respect to the Euclidean volume form because this gives me the G volume form, right? Okay, I'm trying to push everything towards Euclidean and this term is going to be something which I now am ever happy with, okay? So... So integrating this, d mu bar gives me this, right? Then I get integral h bar squared d mu bar. Oh, I forgot, sorry, I didn't, I forgot h bar there. My apologies. Right. What's that? Somebody say, the, the two went over here. I don't know if that was. Okay. Okay, so there's my resulting thing. Well, this term is wonderful, right? Because in Euclidean space, for a sphere, this is a term that we, we know quite well, right? So this guy is 16 pi plus twice the integral of h of, I guess I called it a, Right? So it's, it's twice the integral of integral a naught ring squared d mu bar. Okay, that, that's just the gauss bonnet and the Gauss equations. I've assumed you're a sphere. Right? Okay. Um, of course, I, I guess I could, you could probably also do this with the Wilmore inequality. So, okay. So now, all right, so like a, I, I want to get rid of these factors, okay? So, okay, so let me add, first of all, okay, so this is, this, this, this is like distance squared, that's distance to the negative six, this is negative fourth, then the change in here is like distance to the minus one if I delete this, right? So, I get, Okay, and I, I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to delete this term. Okay, so. All right, so you can just ignore what I did. Um, if I just threw those away, you're going to get something. If, if I don't write that, you'll get a confusing thing in the end, so it's easier to actually write their returns. Okay? Okay. So now, okay. Um, H bar, if you remember, H bar, I don't have very good control over, right? H bar is something related to the inner radius, right? Because H bar is like, H, this is something I'm very happy with, right? But this is the inner radius to the ne negative power. So that's like a kind of a bad scaling term, okay? So this term, kind of a bad term, right? Or could be a bad term. This term, well, okay, it's positive, so let's think about that. It's positive, so it's making integral h bigger. This says integral h can't be too big, right? So that's a, good, that's a good term. This is like creating this tension that I'm looking for, okay? So this term is bad. We want to somehow control this term. So 
the first observation is that this term has something to do with ADM mass. Okay? So if you just look at this integral with no h bar, this integral is 0, because this is a flux integral by the divergence there, because you miss the origin. Right? Okay? So now we have something which integrates to 0, and we multiply it by something complicated, potentially. Well, we'd like to improve this slightly, so we should, act, we should sub subtract a constant from this thing. We're allowed, because this integrates to 0 by the divergence theorem, so we can definitely do this. Okay, since it, the surface is outlying, so it doesn't pick up any flux integral, divergence theorem, so then we can subtract 2 over lambda. Um, yeah? But you need to use the, I guess the divergence of that thing is only 0 to leading order, right? No, no, so, okay, I've thrown away everything bad, but then this is literally something which is divergence free. It's because um, it's, it's like, uh, it's r over like norm r cubed, that's divergence free in r3. And, ah, uh, okay, okay. Because it's the Green's function, yeah, yeah. The, the, but isn't the, sorry, I'm confused with the, is the, is the bar the, the flat metric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've turned everything into the flat metric. So you're taking the Euclidean divergence. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're completely right. So like, um, there was this extra term here. I could also throw that into the divergence. I get something that's approximately zero. That would also work fine. But I threw it over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, of course, this, th th this being divergence three is exactly the same thing as when you, you argue the Hawking mass computes the ADM mass in some sense. So if it wasn't, if it was enclosing the origin, you'd pick up a delta function, and that's going to give you m. OK, modulo a bunch of constants and getting everything right. OK, cool. OK. OK, so um, we, haven't, we haven't really solved our problem. Um, and we still are very, very worried about this middle term. Okay. And so again, I want to bound, I want to say h is big. That's, that's my goal, to create tension with the Chris Dewey estimate. So I want to bound this from below. And well, all that I can think of to do here is use AMGM on this, this inequality. Okay. OK, so you get 16 pi plus twice integral a not squared minus, let me get, OK, so like I'll take the 2 from the 4 and use that as my 2ab bounded by, but then you can always throw in a constant and the 1 over the constant. So let me write it this way. Um, last night I was not sure that this was done with, the, the with things written in the optimal way, but uh, I didn't change it because I thought I would get too confused. OK, so my, this is, tau over 2 is going to be my constant of, of uh, the Peter Paul inequality, whatever you want to call it. OK. OK, so that takes care of this. The 1, 2 is gone because it's 2ab is less than a squared plus b squared, right? So then what I get left over <coughs> is 4m squared over x to the sixth g bar of x comma nu bar d mu bar squared. OK, and of course, I've exactly gotten the other thing, right? So I suspect that there's like a, a shorter way to write this, this argument, these, these two steps, but this is the way that it makes sense to me. OK. So now let's slow down a little bit. We said this term is hopefully going to be a good term. It's not too hard, actually, to see that it's a good term for us. But we want this constant to be positive. right? So here, when is this positive? Well, we want tau to be bigger than 2. OK, so tau was my, tau was my factor in the, in the Peter Paul. Right? It's the factor to which I robbed, which I robbed Peter, I guess. Right? And one over it is how much I pay Paul. 
It's kind of a, doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about it. All right. So, okay. So at this point, um, it's still not clear what to do because this term, I don't, I don't know. So like we've said that we don't understand h bar very well, right? Um, and we're asking like, to what degree is h bar constant in L2? Okay. So, well, let's be a bit, you know, let's be dreamers. So assume Assume that we knew the following sort of inequality. Okay? So assume that, that H's failure to be constant in L2 is controlled by this Wilmore quantity. Okay? If you're um, an aficionado of such inequalities, you'll notice that this is a weaker form of uh, the Delellis Muller inequality, right? Okay. So Delalis and Mueller prove that for some gamma, this is true. That's a consequence of their work. Okay. Right. And so right, it's it's sort of an effective sure inequality, right? If 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 the trace-free second form, form is zero, then you have to be CMC. So this is stating that in some um, some other other way. Okay. Oh, so so let's say. I'll choose the best. I'll, I mean, I, I'm just willing to choose any lambda as long as it works for me. Right. So I haven't chosen it yet. I'll assume that there's some lambda that makes this inequality true. Yeah. And in particular, Delilah and Miller say that there's some gamma and some lambda so that this is true. Okay, okay so now maybe it's clear where this is going. So we get 2 minus tau gamma, right? So we get the 2's cancel. We get tau times gamma, right, here with a minus. OK, and then we have left over Okay, and I'll remind you that we started like this. Okay. So now this is less than 16 pi by the Delellis Muller estimate. So this looks okay, right? However, what we have to do is we have to be quite worried about the various constants, right? So, okay. So We'd like for both of these terms to be not negative. We'd like for this to be positive even. I'm claiming this term is going to contain the final ingredient, although it's not quite clear yet where that is. Okay. This term, however, is a bit of a problem. Okay. So this term, I, I chose tau a bit bigger than 2 in order for this term to, be, to work. And so here, now you need gamma like 1. Right? But what we see is that if that were true, we're very happy, right? So this could be non-negative, and this could be positive, and I claim for us that that's, that's going to make us happy. OK. So um, OK, so first of all, OK. Um, so you can prove that gamma equals 1 would be sharp. So if you try to take gamma less than 1, the inequality is false. Okay. So um, you should be quite worried, because there's not very much room. right? And 
The second, of, second remark, with gamma equals 1, right? You, if you take um, 2 over lambda to be the average of the mean curvature, Um, I'll let you check this. You could, you could check this in about five minutes, um, just from the, the Gauss equations, that this inequality is equivalent to what I would call the Minkowski inequality, but I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of names for this. You know, Minkowski inequality could be something else. But the integral of, of h bar is bounded from low by the area. OK? So the, the sharp inequality is equivalent to the Minkowski inequality. And the Minkowski inequality is not known to hold in, in generality. Right? OK? So, So let me get my name. So okay, all of this is with respect to the Euclidean metric, right? So it's known if you're if the surface is convex. That's classical, maybe due to Minkowski. Um, so more recently. Um, it's proven for mean convex and star shaped or outer minimizing. Right, using inverse mean curvature flow. Outer minimizing is Heskin. Uh, mean convex and star shaped, there's a lot of names. All right, so there's, there's been a lot of work on this sort of inequality, but it's definitely not known to be true um, in, with gamma equals 1. And so the other thing, now if you're following along quite closely, let's say we take tau bigger than 2, right? Then we would need to prove this with gamma less than 1, right? So we're kind of in trouble, OK? And we also doubt, don't know that it's true. OK, so um, let me kind of tell you the resolution of the first problem, and then I'm running out of time, and I'll just briefly explain the idea of the second problem. OK. So here, I think life was almost good, right? Except it was just like a 2 minus something bigger than 2 times 1 in our dream world. But if you think about what we're kind of trying to compare it against, right, we, we're looking at integral a squared minus 16 pi, right? And so what that means is there's an extra left over 2 thirds in the Christie Dudley Yale estimate, right? So the, the Christie Dudley Yale estimate is giving us a little bit of room here to fudge gamma. So even if gamma is slightly bigger than 1, with the Christie Dudley Yale estimate, you're in OK shape, OK? So of course, um, there's still the problem that you don't know that the Minkowski inequality holds. Um, but what we've done is, um, so um, the, the basic idea is to prove first, and I won't explain how this works, but you first prove that sigma, so if you remember the sigma, when you rescale, it converges to a sphere through the origin. Okay, so the first step is to prove that the rescaled surfaces have bounded mean curvature in the, the blowdown metric. So, and actually that follows if you carry this argument. If you use this argument, you can first prove that the mean curvature stays bounded. Okay, it's not obvious. But then you have a, a sequence of things with bounded mean curvature. So Allard tells you that the blowdown surfaces converge in C1 alpha because you have bounded mean curvature. Right? So you converge in C1 alpha. Okay? But now, being a C1 alpha graph over a sphere, 
as far as I can tell, does not fit into any of these conditions. But what you can do, um, and like, um, and so this uh, Perez, a student of, of Delelis, in his thesis analyzed this inequality at the linear level. Right? And OK, his setup didn't work, doesn't exactly follow this, but you can basically do what he did and show that if, you're, if you converge in C1 alpha, this star is true with gamma like asymptotically sharp. And now it all, it all adds up, and you get, you get the theorem, although I didn't quite show you how this good term tells you what you want. But I'll stop there. <laughs>